Neutrinos are the enigmatic ghosts of the subatomic world. They only rarely interact in our detectors and have surprised scientists more than once. For instance, while the original idea of neutrinos supposed that there was only a single kind of neutrino, it turns out that there are actually three distinct variants. One class of neutrino is associated with electrons and is called the electron type neutrino. The other two kinds of neutrinos are associated with cousins of the electron, the muon and the tau. Accordingly, these other types are called muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. Scientists use the lowercase Greek letter nu to indicate a neutrino with a subscript to tell you what kind it is. The way scientists discovered that there were three different kinds of neutrinos is that neutrinos seem to remember their origins. For instance, an experiment in 1962 created neutrinos in tandem with a muon. If one of those neutrinos was then collided into an atomic nucleus, only muons were generated in the collision, never electrons and never tau particles. The neutrino remembered how it was made. This observation led to a Nobel Prize in 1988. With the observation that neutrinos have distinct types, scientists thought that they understood neutrinos reasonably well. However, they continued to study them. In 1964, one scientist wanted to study neutrinos originated in the biggest nuclear reactor around, the Sun. Raymond Davis was a chemist by trade. He knew that neutrinos could interact with chlorine and make argon. He also knew that neutrinos interacted very weakly and you'd need a huge number of chlorine atoms to make it work. So he took a huge vat of perchloroethylene, which is just a scientific name for dry cleaning fluid. The vat contained 100 thousand gallons of liquid. That's about the size of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. He calculated that for every week of operation that he could expect to create 10 atoms of argon. Yeah, you, you heard me right, 10 atoms. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. Now that number should have blown your mind. His vat contained about 9 million 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 atoms of chlorine, and 10 of them should be converted to argon. This just sounds impossible, and yet it turned out that Davis could do just that. So what did he find? Well, it turns out that he didn't find the 10 atoms he expected. He found only three. The easiest explanation was that either the prediction or the measurement was wrong, and yet many follow-on experiments confirmed his results. He was detecting fewer neutrinos than expected. This came to be called the solar neutrino deficit. Now, you should be forgiven if you believe that somehow the entire field of neutrino physics made a huge mistake. However, another class of experiments told a similar tale. Another source of neutrinos came from cosmic rays, which is the constant pelting of high-energy protons from the deepest space slamming into the atmosphere. Because of how the cosmic rays interact, each electron-type neutrino should be accompanied by two muon-type neutrinos. While the solar neutrino deficit could have been due to improper measurement or calculation, it is very difficult to imagine how neutrinos from cosmic rays could occur in any ratio other than one electron type to two muon types. So what was measured? Well, different experiments observed different results, but it was generally true that there were fewer muon neutrinos than expected. Another mystery had appeared, this one called the atmospheric neutrino problem. In the mid to late 1950s, Italian-born physicist Bruno Pontecorvo hypothesized that it would be possible for the different flavors of neutrinos to oscillate into one another. If the idea was true, then a bunch of electron neutrinos could gradually morph into muon neutrinos and then back again to electron neutrinos. At the time he came up with the idea, only one kind of neutrino was known to exist, so his proposed oscillations were of neutrinos into their antimatter equivalents. However, we now know that the right way to think about neutrino oscillations is between the three distinct types. The first compelling evidence for neutrino oscillations came in 1998 using the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan. This detector is a huge underground cavern filled with 50,000 tons of water surrounded by detectors called phototubes. Rare neutrinos would interact in the water and give off a blink of light. Using that blink of light, you could identify the trajectory of the neutrino. By separating it out neutrinos created in the atmosphere directly above, which was about 12 miles away, from neutrinos created on the other side of the Earth, which was about 8,000 miles away, they proved that it was the neutrinos that traveled a large distance that had changed their identity most. The snow experiment in a mine deep under Sudbury, Ontario, clinched it. Neutrinos were changing their identity. 
In the past decade, scientists have studied neutrino oscillation using beams of neutrinos made at particle physics laboratories. The Fermilab accelerator near Chicago, the CERN accelerator near Geneva, Switzerland, and the KEK accelerator in Japan all fire beams of neutrinos through the Earth to targets hundreds of miles away. These experiments have made tremendous headway in understanding the phenomenon of neutrino oscillation. However, there remain significant questions in the details of neutrino oscillations. The next decade is expected to be the era in which neutrinos tell us their enigmatic tale.